There was a youth group that met, had about 12 of the young people gathering, and the youth minister presented a moral dilemma to them. He said, imagine your ship is going down in the sea. There is one lifeboat, and it can hold 11 passengers on the lifeboat. You are 12, what would you do? So the young people started talking amongst themselves and one said, well, they're gonna need me because I'm the strongest and I'll have to row. And then one of the girls said, well, I'm the most intelligent. I can come up with various plans for us. And then one after another presented why he or she would be needed. And then there was one young girl who looked within and thought, well, I don't have any particular gifts to give. So she said, I suppose you'd have to throw me off the lifeboat. And her classmates kind of looked at her. They didn't know what to say. Because they gave no response, she actually believed that she was not worthwhile and attempted to take her life that very night. Fortunately, she did not succeed. But you can imagine when the youth group came together, they realized their sin of omission. So often we talk about sins of commission, but in this case it was a sin of omission, for they failed to reach out to her and to encourage her. You see, our dignity is not based on what we can do. Our dignity is based on who we are. And we are all children of the living God. And so we have a responsibility to one another. In the case that is presented in John chapter 8, you will recall that they bring forth the woman. The man, we don't know what happened to him. Maybe he fled. But they bring this woman caught in adultery and they have encircled her and she should well know, according to the Mosaic law, there were three capital crimes. The first, murder. The second, blasphemy. And the third, adultery. She knew her fate. She was going to be killed. She would be stoned. But they bring this to Jesus because there was a little quirk in the law. Since Israel was now under the control of the Romans, only the Romans were allowed to carry out the capital punishment. So the Israelites would have to seek permission from Rome, as they did for Jesus. On what charge? The second one, remember? Blasphemy. And it was carried out not according to what the Romans would seek, because they could care less about blasphemy in the, in the Israelite community, but they found other ways to get, get Jesus convicted. But in the case of the woman, Jesus says something that we never see anywhere else in Scripture. He bends down and begins to write in the dust. And it is a desert land, so there was lots of dust and scholars debate what on earth Jesus was writing. Now, when did the finger of God write something before this encounter? Well, let's go back to Mount Sinai. When God wrote the Ten Commandments in stone to give to Moses. So one of the theories to which I ascribe is that Jesus was writing the Ten Commandments in the dust. And as the accusers were observing this, he would be certain to make sure they see themselves. When he asked the question, who among you has committed no sin? Cast the first stone. And one after another, they have to back away because we have all sinned. And once they depart, Jesus asks her, has no one condemned you? No one, sir. Neither do I condemn you. Therefore, go and sin no more. This woman had what we call in Lent a complete metanoia, a turning around. She thought as she was encircled by these people, she was going to be killed. And instead she was free and given abundant life, life in Christ. And imagine how many people's lives were changed by her testimony, by her witness. 
Jesus in this eighth chapter then goes on to say, I am the light of the world. He came to scatter the darkness. And those of us who have received his light, and that would be the grace of baptism, are meant to carry it on. Why do you think we give a candle at baptism? The baptismal candle. You have received the light of Christ. Now run with that light into the world. Look at what the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah in the first reading tonight. The Lord said, Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? In other words, can't you see what I, your Lord, want to do with you? I want to make you new. I want to change you. Bring about this metanoia, this turning around. We'll look at how it happened in the life of St. Paul. Saul was one of the biggest persecutors of the early church. He was going after the followers of this Jesus. And you will recall, was knocked down, blinded, and heard the voice say, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He had never met Jesus. Who are you, Lord, he asks. And he reveals himself. So how could Jesus ask the question, why are you persecuting me? Because he was per persecuting his mystical body on earth, the members of the church. And when you persecute Christ's church, you persecute Christ because he's the head, we are the members of that body. And what happened to Saul? Saul could have run away and beat himself up the rest of his life. But instead, he was completely transformed and spent the rest of his life bringing this good news to people who had not yet heard it, particularly the Gentile community. So it, it can happen in very dramatic ways, as it did in the case of Saul, who became St. Paul. Or some of you may be familiar with the story of Abby Johnson, a film about her has just come out, Unplanned, based on her book. She, who was a persecutor of life, became a great defender and promoter after a dramatic conversion. But it might be as simple a conversion as to be aware of that young person who was so little thought of that she thought her life was expendable. When no one's life is expendable in the eyes of God. So you see, it can be sins of commission or it might be a simple omission that could be devastating. So as we walk through these last weeks of Lent, we would do well to look inside because instead of pointing the finger at somebody else, as did the Pharisees, this woman, we must remember there are many other fingers that are pointing to ourselves. And we're the only one that we can really answer for. We don't know what's happening in someone else's life. But we can fairly well figure out what's happening inside our own. And that's the life that Jesus wants us to bring to him for transformation. So that like the psalmist, we too can say, the Lord has done great things for us. We are filled with joy. Amen. Thank you.